So for uh, violent right-wing extremism and terrorism in the United States. So defining and measuring domestic terrorism in the US has been, it's a little bit trickier than in the European states in this report. Uh, while US law defines domestic terrorism as illegal acts meant to intimidate, coerce, or impact government policy, it does not have associated criminal penalties. So with, this means that the federal government prosecutes crimes that might meet the definition of domestic terrorism under statutes used for murder, making threats, illegally possessing automatic weapons or explosives, just to, to use a few examples. So cases are obviously still prosecuted. However, one of the results of the lack of a domestic terrorism charge is that it's difficult to get the full data picture of extreme right domestic terrorism cases in the US. At the federal level, attacks motivated by extreme right-wing ideology might be prosecuted as hate crimes if the victim or survivor uh, was in a protected category. Federal law enforcement investigates crime, not ideology. Hate speech and membership in right-wing extremist groups are, are legal in the US uh, compared to other, other countries in this report. Uh, and also it must be noted that there are state laws that have penalties for terrorism. So in 34 US states and in Washington DC, and all, there are also uh, federal and state laws for terroristic threats and threats involving infrastructure or explosives. However, this includes both crimes with ideological motivations as well as crimes with no clear ideological motivation. So going to the federal definitions, three of the four 2019 definitions used by the Federal Bureau of Investigation are directly related to right-wing extremism. And those are racially motivated violent extremism, which includes white supremacist violence, anti-government and anti-authority extremism, which includes the militia movement and other extreme right anti-government ideology, such as the Boogaloo movement and sovereign citizen ideology and then what is officially classified as, as abortion extremism. Um, it's possible that in the future with the rise of eco-fascism in the US that animal rights and environmental extremism might also affect the extreme right, uh, but that remains to be seen. So statistically, uh, for the years 2015 to July 2020, there were 68 plots and violent crimes committed by individuals and groups in the categories of racially motivated violent extremism or anti-government extremism and related extremist ideologies. So this includes um, 37 incidents committed by white supremacist groups, which were 54% of total cases in the report. Uh, and this includes groups such as the Rise Above Movement, a white supremacist group, and it includes accelerationist neo-Nazi groups such as the Atomwaffen Division, the Base, and the Foyer Creek Division. Anti-government ideology accounted for 21 incidents, which were 31% of cases in the report. And this includes militia groups, the Boogaloo Movement, and violence committed by sovereign citizens. The remaining 10 incidents committed by individuals uh, subscribed to single issue right-wing ideologies uh, such as male supremacist ideology and anti-Muslim ideology. These of course are linked to other, other strains of the far right, um, but are just classified as, as single issue for the purpose of, uh, of, of classifying them. And in these, in these instances, 61 people were killed and 97 were injured uh, in these 68 attacks. 25 incidents, which were 37% were successful, meaning that an attack took place and in 43 incidents, 63% were, were unsuccessful. 72% of successful attacks resulted in at least one injury or death. And individuals were more likely to be successful. They carried a 40% success rate, while groups were less successful. They had a 28% success rate. So individuals um, planning attacks are, are more likely to be successful. And the three most lethal attacks were committed by individual white supremacists with firearms. And these were uh, the Charleston church shooting uh, on, on uh, June 17th, 2015, uh, where Dylan Roof murdered nine people. Uh, the Pittsburgh synagogue shooting on October 27th, 2018, 
or Robert Bowers murdered nine people, or sorry, murdered 11 people, um, and the El Paso Walmart shooting on August 3rd, 2019, where Patrick Cruzius murdered 22 people with one individual additionally dying of their wounds after the attack. The online component has been very important for the founding of right-wing, extreme right-wing organizations uh, and their recruitment and propaganda efforts. The Iron March Forum, which was online from 2011 to 2017, was the online birthplace of the Adam Waffen Division, uh, which is, was active in the US and Germany and has copycat organizations in Europe and Russia. So uh, Iron March is also an important site for national action in the UK and the Nordic resistance movement in, in Scandinavia. Um, following the demise of Iron March uh, was the rise of, of Fascist Forge, which operated from 2018 to 2020 and was used for recruitment and propaganda by members of the base, uh, the base being located in the US, UK, mainland Europe, and also internationally in Australia and South Africa. And Fascist Forge was also used by the Feuerkrieg Division, um, active in the US, UK, and mainland Europe. A big component also of online activities of the extreme right have been the 8chan Politically Incorrect Board and 8chan Successor Image Boards. And these are boards where they, they glorify acts of terrorism and encourage individuals to commit attacks. Uh, Brenton Tarrant, the Christchurch terrorist, posted links to his manifesto and live stream on 8chan. And the Poway, California synagogue shooter and the El Paso shooter each posted their manifestos on 8chan's politically incorrect board before their attacks. And the board kind of has this, this infrastructure recirculating memes, manifestos, and other content praising the shooters. And this has continued um, since the demise of 8chan on 8chan's successor image boards, both on the surface and, and dark web. Telegram also plays an integral part of the extreme right online, uh, allowing for the, the spread of propaganda, bomb making instructions in communities that encourage acts of terrorism. It's been used by individuals linked to the Adam Waffen Division, the base, the Fourier Creek Division, and many others. Uh, it's only until very recently, in January 2021, that Telegram has taken uh, significant and systemic action to remove right wing extremist content. And the platform has been incredibly useful for, uh, you know, for not only unidirectional propaganda, but also for through chats, through individuals being able to make connections to find groups that they, they might be interested in to make these connections online. And with online activities, also traditional social media and online platforms such as Facebook and YouTube uh, are, are still very important and used to spread propaganda and plan and, and advertise events. Uh, when it comes to financing of many of these groups, uh, they're mostly self-funded. Uh, a lot of these are individuals going to meetups, um, whether it's in their own region or in you know, other regions of the United States, but uh, these are you know, really self-funded efforts here. Um, there, there's been limited sale of merchandise, including t-shirts and other clothing by groups such as the Rise Above Movement. And in the Rise Above Movement's case, the sale of merchandise from other groups and their affiliated brands has sort of the purpose of bringing kind of the broader extreme right movement in the US and Europe closer together. So the Ram store will sell gear from, uh, you know, from White Rex located in, in Ukraine and Russia as a way of sort of forging an alliance between, between these groups. And then extreme right websites such as Fascist Forge and the Daily Stormer have requested and in some cases received cryptocurrency donations. Uh, the Daily Stormer received approximately $60,000 in cryptocurrency after the deadly Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville in 2017. Uh, but it should be noted that this is really an outlier when it comes to cryptocurrency donations. It's not entirely possible to know uh, how much cryptocurrency uh, these sites have received due to the difficulties in tracking some of them. Uh, but most extreme right websites in the United States take in actually very little. Uh, they take in less than $100 in terms of their fundraising efforts through, through crypto. So there's, when it comes to transnational connectivity uh, in the United States and Europe, there, there have been high levels of connectivity between white supremacist groups in the US and Europe. 
Um, the Adam Walton Division has communicated with members in uh, the UK's National Action via Iron March, and they had at least one per in-person meeting in 2015. Uh, there have been further communications between members of the Adam Wathen Division and members of the System Resistance Network and the Southern Creek Division. The German chapter of Adam Wathen was founded in, in 2018, and there have been Adam Wathen inspired groups in Europe and Russia. An American woman living in Germany uh, was at one point alerted by authorities that an American member of the Adam Wathen Division had entered the country. Uh, possibly with intent to, to hurt her. Uh, luckily, this individual was stopped uh, before, before it progressed. And members of the Adam Waffen Division have attended uh, National Socialist Black Metal events in Europe, including the Asgard Zerai Festival, uh, which is this massive networking opportunity for American and European groups, including the German Third Way, uh, the Italian group Casa Pound, uh, Golden Dawn in Greece, and individuals affiliated with the, the Ukrainian Azov movement. Uh, as one example of music festivals uh, tracking individuals from the US who then go and, and can network in Europe. And uh, the base is an international organization uh, that really with most of their members in the US, but I think it's most important to, to really look at them as being international. The group has sought to recruit members in the UK uh, due to ideological compatibility with groups like the Sonnen Krieg Division and the Foyer Krieg Division there. Uh, the base has wanted to expand in Europe and has also tried to recruit in mainland Europe, uh, in Belgium and the Netherlands. And the former leader of the base uh, currently lives in St. Petersburg, Russia. Uh, he has no proven links to the Russian government, uh, but he has been able to remain in Russia. Uh, the Foyer Krieg Division, uh, as an international accelerationist group that's been heavily inspired by the Adam Waffen Division, uh, it's mainly organizing in the online space. Um, has members in the US, Russia, uh, and Estonia, Latvia, Belgium, the UK, Ireland, Netherlands, Norway, and Germany. Uh, and there are two plots linked to Foyer Creek in the US, uh, both either involving explosive components or bomb making guides uh, by, by members affiliated with, with Foyer Creek. The Rise Above movement uh, has you know, incredibly strong ties uh, to the extreme right European mixed martial arts scene. Uh, Rise Above movement is really an attempt to import the concept of a European far right club based around violence, martial arts, and sport. Uh, group members uh, from RAM have attended the neo-Nazi Sword and Shield Festival in Austritz, Germany in April 2018. Between April 2018 and February 2020, group members have attended MMA events in Kiev, Ukraine, and extreme right-wing political events in Italy, Bulgaria, Hungary, and Serbia. The group's co-founder, uh, Robert Rundo, currently lives and travels in Europe, uh, where he currently operates an online propaganda group that seeks to create further ties between US and European far-right scenes. A big part of this is sort of about bridging the divide that has historically existed between uh, the extreme right in the United States and the extreme right in Europe. And the, as previously mentioned, uh, RAM also has a relationship uh, with the French white supremacist MMA brand Pride France and Ukrainian and Russian white supremacist MMA brands White Rex and a RAM affiliated clothing label and, and media group. Um, and then in the American context also, uh, it's very important to focus on uh, so-called lone actor uh, mass violence. So regarding mass casualty acts of violence committed by individuals, uh, Patrick Cruzius and John Ernest, responsible for the El Paso and Poe attacks respectively, uh, really copied elements of the Christchurch terrorist Brenton Terrence manifesto. And you know, with Tarrant also in turn, um, you know, taking elements uh, from from, you know, from previous attacks, from the attack in Norway. Uh, Cruzius and Ernest also have chose soft targets um, and, and posted on the same 8chan board as, as Tarrant. Uh, additional attacks in Barham, Norway and Holland, Germany were stylistically and ideologically similar, invoking white supremacist great replacement ideology. Perpetrators learned from prior attacks uh, and in the case of the Holland shooter sought to innovate by using homemade weapons. And each attacker uh, was then memorialized in this online space devoted to spreading memes and, and violent white supremacist ideology. Uh, regarding regarding uh, the federal response, um, so the 
The FBI is the principal federal law enforcement agency. And in spring 2019, the FBI created domestic terrorism hate crimes fusion cells to increase communication and information sharing between agents working in the counterterrorism division and the criminal investigative division. Uh, local joint terrorism task forces, which are composed of federal agencies and state and local law enforcement agencies, uh, added, added a domestic terrorism focus, which was quite important for addressing this threat. And additionally, in 2020, the FBI prioritized combating right-wing extremism and racially motivated violent extremism in particular, placing it on the same threat level as, as ISIL, uh, which is incredibly important for, um, I mean, not only for resources, but also for, for really kind of getting the message out there that this is something that the federal government uh, has, has to confront. Uh, the Department of Homeland Security is responsible for, for data collection and analysis, uh, for supplying grants to local law enforcement agencies. Uh, local law enforcement agencies play a very important role in recognizing and responding to violence from the extreme right. And there's also the grant bidding Office of Community Partnerships, which in 2016, uh, of the 25 programs uh, that, were, that were giving grants, um, only two of them specifically mentioned right-wing extremism. In 2017, the only program to specifically address de-radicalization efforts among right-wing extremists um, had their funding cut. However, um, with the newly formed Office of Targeted Violence and Terrorism Prevention, which gave grants in September 2020, um, of the 29 different projects that received grants, three of these projects directly addressed right-wing extremism. And then in addition to that, there are grants that uh, address issues such as targeted violence and youth and community education and societal resilience, which might overlap with efforts to prevent right-wing violence uh, and radicalization. And then uh, finally, and very importantly, um, with the State Department's designation of the Russian Imperial Movement as a foreign terrorist organization in April 2020, um, shows that the federal government is really looking at this approach uh, transnationally and looking at ways that it can prevent linkage uh, between US and foreign groups and with partners in, in Europe. And this is the first time that a white supremacist group has been designated as, as a foreign terrorist organization by, by the US government. Um, I think it's important to also mention, uh, kind of in the context of this, uh, January 6th, um, and you know, the Capitol insurrection on, on January 6th is really in, an example of how different groups and movements and both the far and extreme right can temporarily cooperate with one another. It also shows that the end results for different groups and movements um, don't always align. So following that temporary cooperation, uh, they, they can diverge from one another. So while January 6th well, you know, wasn't a win for the QAnon movement, it is being seen as a victory by, by white supremacists who endorse violence. It shows that events like this can occur um, for individuals who would like to see this and, and further, further, violent, further violent events, um, whether in DC or at, at state houses. And it's also, you know, it's very important that this was a mix, um, not only of different groups, but that it was a mix of mainstream and alternative social media platforms used for, for planning and propaganda by, by participants. And really, you know, the, the responses from the Biden administration um, are, you know, there, there are many opportunities, uh, such, such as reworking the, um, the federal response to racially motivated violent extremism and anti-government violent extremism. Um, there will be more government attention on movements and groups that have previously uh, you know, escaped extensive federal government scrutiny, uh, such as QAnon, the Proud Boys, and the Oath Keepers. And there are several opportunities that will be evaluated by, by Congress and the Biden administration, uh, which could, could include a domestic terrorism statute, uh, which it should be noted is extremely controversial. Um, there are also issues related to, uh, there's a potential for mandatory hate crime reporting for law enforcement at the local, state, tribal level uh, and improved record keeping. Uh, there's also the Domestic Terrorism Prevention Act, uh, which would create offices in DHS, DOJ, and the FBI to specifically deal with domestic terrorism cases, increase, include, increase statistical reporting, uh, to Congress and the promotion of information sharing between federal, state, local, and tribal governments on domestic terrorism, 
and the creation of an interagency task force to investigate white supremacism in the US military and law enforcement. It's also possible that there might be going forward increased numbers of grants through DHS's targeted violence and terrorism prevention program uh, for organizations working, working in the counter radicalization space. Challenges moving forward, uh, as previously described, uh, there's how, how the federal government will confront right-wing extremism and whether this will mean new laws, improved reporting and record keeping, uh, in addition to federal prioritization. Uh, a huge challenge moving forward will be the lasting impact of conspiracy theories and how they're, they're addressed at all levels of government and society. Uh, very importantly, uh, QAnon, also issues related to coronavirus, uh, an anti-vaccine sentiment. Uh, there are continued threats to vulnerable targets by armed white supremacists and other ideologically motivated terrorists. And then issues related to smaller groups and networks that practice better operation security. So instead of groups with 20 to 60 people that have an official flag, symbols, and leadership structure, uh, where the online space is key for communicating and organizing, uh, there is potential that more and more extreme right groups that look to commit acts of violence will be local and composed of between three and five individuals uh, who are already known to one another uh, as ways of uh, improving information and operation security uh, to, to keep out law enforcement or anti-fascist activists. And sort of a growing trend as well is a greater cyber and information security uh, practiced by members of, of the extreme right. Um, as ways to sort of ma maintain, maintain control of the online space. Uh, thank you, thank you very much.